Hello guys, welcome to an online edition of Server of Criminal Justice. This is your instructor, Dr. Cabajan. I know I sound very excited, but that's because I'm drinking a lot of coffee and my mother is down there doing what she does best, seasoning that turkey. So I'm very excited to hold class uh, from uh, the comforts of my house. All right, so what we're gonna do today, we're gonna continue the lecture and we are, I think last time I spoke to you, we left right here. We were talking about types of trials. Remember, the whole point of a trial is to adjudicate. And if you remember, adjudication simply means determining guilt. There's two ways that you can do this. You can do this through a bench trial where the judge is the one adjudicating. The judge evaluates the evidence and determines whether or not, based on the evidence, you committed the offense. In a jury trial, you have the same process, the same process of adjudication, but now you have a panel of citizens determining whether or not, based on the evidence, you are guilty of committing the offense. Now, the process of adjudication, uh, jury trial, let's talk about the jury first. Uh, ju you know, the process of selecting the jury, it it's very, very long, as some of you may have experienced jury duty. Uh, but it first starts with a random selection uh, uh, of citizens. Uh, and the, the purpose of the random selection is that whenever you take a random sample of any population, that random sample, if it's truly random, then it's supposed to represent the community. It's supposed to give a fair representation, an unbiased representation of the members of the community, however they may be or whoever they may be. And this is very important when it comes to trials because the Constitution guarantees a trial by your peers, right? And the, that, that peers means that they should, you know, that the, 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 the members of that jury should resemble the members of the community from which you come from, or, or at least in which you committed the crime. Uh, so why have jury trials? Because jury trials take a lot of time, they take a lot of money. Uh, there are several reasons. If you get, the first one is that, uh, if you guys remember, the, the founding fathers were very concerned about giving too much power to government. Particularly they were concerned that the government will have the ability to charge you with crimes, right, and prosecute you or convict you without any real evidence. And so they decided to create a jury system so that uh, as a safe mechanism, right, as a safety mechanism so that the jury could evaluate the charges and could evaluate the evidence brought against you. So the, the first purpose of a trial is to prevent government oppression by safeguarding citizens against arbitrary law enforcement. Second, uh, the, the, the juries are there to determine whether the accused is guilty on the basis of evidence presented. Third, uh, they represent a diverse community of interests, so that no one values, no one type of peoples or biases dominate the decision making. This is where random selection plays a very, very big component of that, because when you select something by random, when you select a group of people by random, if, if they're in fact randomly selected, then they will represent, they're supposed to be representative of the community which you come from. Um, juries also serve as a buffer between the accused and the accuser, an arbitrary third party. And fifth of all, uh, jury, jury trials promote knowledge about the criminal justice system uh, by being exposed to it, right? You are selected for jury duty, you go into the court, um, you might, uh, you're going to get uh, questions uh, questioned by lawyers and prosecutors. And through that interaction, you will learn more about what criminal justice, what the criminal justice system is all about, and what we, what we do. Those are the purposes of uh, the trial of jury trial. Um, however, for the jury system to work, jury members must have several qualities which are very, very important. These are all theoretical, right? They must be unbiased. They must be open-minded. They must be intelligent. And ideally, they will be able to evaluate complex evidence. Now, you know, this is sort of the ideal situation, and often it doesn't happen. So, at the end of the day, lawyers, what they'll do is that they'll, you know, they'll, they'll go for people that are, the best that you can hope for as a lawyer is someone that will be um, unbiased towards your client, right? So, everything, that, the everything, and, and not only towards your client, Towards your, towards your client, but also towards 
the crime in for which he was accused so it's this is very very important there's no way that you're gonna get a person that is completely unbiased about absolutely everything because that doesn't exist but people are more unbiased people are more open-minded about certain people and certain things than others so the ideal situation then is not this sort of uh thing that is almost impossible to get but rather people that are going to be open-minded for your client whatever your client however your client is or who or what he does or who he is or what race he is and also the type of crime for which he's being accused this is also very 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 important uh, and, you know, what many lawyers end up doing is that, you know, in fact, they don't really care about being unbiased. They, they want someone to be biased in favor of their client, right? Uh, so this is, this here is sort of the ideal, but of course, we don't live in that world where people are totally unbiased, totally open-minded. So sometimes the best we can hope for is people that are open-minded for our clients, for our case, um, and so forth so now once you have selected a uh, a jury by random um, then the second process starts within which is the selection process um, who among the people that came for jury duty are we going to select for this particular case the, this process of questioning assessing and selecting jurors uh, it's called Vodir. Uh, excuse, my, my, you know, excuse my French. I don't speak any French. Uh, so I'm probably killing it, but it's Vodir. Um, which means in French to speak the truth. Now, lawyers, both the, pro both, both the prosecutor and the defense attorney, they're going to question um, uh, the prospective jurors on a variety of different uh, subjects. It could range from, do you know the judge? Uh, to what type of TV shows do you watch? What type of music do you like? Uh, it could be really anything that could help the prosecutor. It could help the defense attorney determine whether or not, um, you know, the prospective juror holds any biases or otherwise is incapable of delivering a fair um, verdict. These are very important things. So they can get, they, lawyers get to ask whatever they want to help them determine that. Now, Lawyers uh, can get rid of any prospective juror, uh, and when a, uh, when, a, uh, when a lawyer gets rid of you, and, and essentially he does a challenge, right? So there's two types of challenges. There's two types of ways that you can get rid of someone, of a prospective juror. The first one is a challenge for cause. Uh, that is the removal of a prospective juror by showing that he or she has some bias or some other legal disability. Right? So a challenge for cause is the removal of a jury, a prospective juror for a particular valid reason. And not only are you going to say, I, 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 you know, I'm going to challenge jury number seven for cause, but you have to actually state, you have to tell the defense attorney, you have to tell the judge why that is. What is the cause, right? What is the thing that you believe will make, uh, makes this particular prospective juror uh, biased or uh, not or unable to uh, have an open mind so challenges for cause you have lawyers have an unlimited number of challenges for cause but again they have to be able to verbalize what it is the try uh, you know the the what it is make makes that prospective juror unable to have an open mind or makes that pr prospective juror biased so they have an unlimited number of challenges for cause the other type of challenges that lawyers have, both the defense attorney uh, and the and the prosecutor, are peremptory challenges. And a peremptory challenge is a removal of prospective juror without giving any reason. You don't have to explain why that is, right? Um, it does. It can be any reason. You don't like the skin color of the person. You don't like her hair. You don't like the shoes. Uh, any reason is completely valid on under the peremptory challenges. Unlike challenges for cause, however, pr the prosecutor and the defense attorney have a limited a limited number of such challenges. So the defense attorney gets eight to ten challenges depending on the type of case, and the prosecution gets six to eight challenges depending again on the severity, the seriousness, and of, of, of the case. 
Uh, so you have two types of challenges, challenges for cost, which are unlimited, and peremptory challenges, which are for any reason um, whatsoever. Um, here, this, wait a minute, there we go. So here, this scene sort of uh, it encapsulates what we're talking about, which, the, the, the notion of a peremptory challenge. Watch this. Mr. Clinton, let me ask you this. Do you think as a juror, you would be able to set aside any prior opinion you might hold about the savings and loan industry? That was a question, sir. What? Do I like bankers? <clears throat> uh, Your Honor, may I have a minute, please, to confer with my colleagues? You may. Dump them. Why you right, let's get rid of number four, six. And I'd say lose number 12, except the prosecutor's going to fuck up and do it for us. Number six? You're kidding, right? She's my first choice. She's my first pass. And four? With the dreadlocks. That's crazy. That's a defendant's juror if I ever saw it. Did you see his shoes? Uh, look, kid. Maybe down in Florida, you are the next big thing. This is New York, Manhattan. We're not squeezing all just here. He polishes those shoes every night. He makes his own clothes. He may look like a brother with an attitude to you, but I see a man with a shotgun under his bed. And woe betide the creature who steps into his garden. And number six, your favorite, she's damaged goods. She's a Catholic school teacher. Believes in human frailty? No. There's something missing from her. She's wrong. She wants on this jury. Somebody hurt her and she wants revenge. How the hell do you know that? I don't know. Look, either you put a stop to this happy or shit or I walk. Walk. All right, here's the deal. I lose with your jury. You do the explaining. Your Honor, may I continue? We'd like to excuse jurors three, four, and six. Okay, so this uh, scene sort of encapsulates what I'm talking about parentary challenges. Any reason whatsoever. Now, uh, you know, of course, we know that Keanu Reeves here is the son of the devil in this movie, so of course he has a sort of a, super, a little superpower that's able to tell him what uh, what the, the prospective jurors are thinking. But in real life, we don't have those guys, right? Uh, hopefully not. Uh, but in real life, what we do have, however, are experts on jury selections, and they have vast amounts of data, just tremendous amounts of data. And... And with that data, what they can do is they can predict sort of uh, how the how that prospective juror, based on their demographic characteristics, educational background, and all the types of information, uh, how that juror is going to go on the trial, how open-minded that person is likely to be. Um, and, you know, they make a whole lot of money doing that. But there is a scientific aspect uh, to jury selection process. But again, you need a lot of money to hire those services. All right, let's go back to the to the to the trial, the trial proceedings, right? As you guys remember, we have in America an adversarial process. We have a process in which the uh, the in which the prosecutor here um, has one argument. The prosecutor has charged the individual. He believes the individual is guilty, and he's going to put on a case to show to the jury members that he is in fact guilty of the crimes for which he's been charged. The defense attorney on the other hand, his only job is to sort of fight the case, in most cases fight the case that the prosecutor brings on, right? The judge on this exchange, the judge is a sort of uh, a neutral third party, a neutral referee, and his job is to make sure that people are following the rules. At the end of the day, uh, once the fight is over, quote unquote, um, uh, jury members which decide which which argument, which case they believe the most. They believe the case that the prosecution put on, or they believe more uh, the case uh, that the defense attorneys uh, 
put on. So it's an adversarial process. It's not really particularly about finding the truth, but about two people going against each other and jury members deciding which one that they believe the most. But however, but it, some important aspects to remember about this uh, sort of adversarial process, there's several aspects that you have to know to sort of understand the rules of the game. The first one is uh, that the accused is presumed to be innocent until proven guilty. So ultimately, the defense attorney doesn't really have to do anything, right? The, his client is presumed to be innocent. He has to, pr to be proven guilty. And that job falls to the prosecution. The prosecution carries the burden of proof proving beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant committed the attack. Again, it is the prosecution that has that burden of proof. He must show that the defense that that the um, defendant committed the crimes. And so from that perspective, um, from that perspective, uh, the prosecution really has the, mo the the hardest job. The, the prosecution has to show beyond a reasonable doubt, right? And by, by reasonable, beyond a reasonable doubt, I don't mean that complete certainty, but I mean that no reasonable person will have a reasonable doubt given the evidence provided, right? So it's not complete certainty, but again, it's a very, very difficult job. The prosecution has the most difficult job. The defense attorney, uh, his job is really to uh, make sure that uh, to poke holes at the evidence and the arguments put forth by the prosecution. The job of the defense attorney really is to create reasonable doubt on the prosecution's case. That's his entire um, job. So this, um, um, and so. Uh, the prosecutor, uh, the prosecution uh, carries most. Double check. Well, what the hell was that? Uh, so the prosecution must put on a case, right? P must put on a case uh, that the defendant is guilty, and he will do that by showing different kinds of evidence. The first kind of evidence that he will put is real evidence. This is physical evidence, such as weapons, records, fingerprints, uh, stolen property. Another type of evidence is demonstrative evidence, evidence that is not based on witness testimony but demonstrates information relevant to the crime, maps, x-rays, pictures, uh, CCTV footage. Another type of evidence is testimony, testimony or evidence which is auto evidence provided by legally competent witnesses. And direct evidence which is eyewitness accounts but you also have uh, well, not direct evidence, but circumstantial evidence. This is supposed to be circumstantial evidence here. And circumstantial evidence is evidence from which a jury must infer a fact. So an example of circumstantial evidence is that witness uh, X uh, saw Smith go into the bar and some shots were fired and then he saw witness, uh, Smith come out of the bar and when uh, witness X went into the bar, uh, you know, John Smith uh, died or something. He was dead on the floor, right? Well, the witness never saw um, Smith kill Joe, but uh, you have to make the jury will have to make the inference that he did, right? So that is uh, circumstantial evidence. Remember, this one here is not direct evidence; it's circumstantial evidence. Uh, so again. Uh, the, the, the key assumption here is that the accused, the defendant, is presumed to be innocent until proven guilty. Uh, so the defense is not really required to put in any kind of case, right? His only job is to make sure, is to cast a reasonable doubt, right? Is to cast a reasonable doubt. That is his only job in most cases. In certain cases, uh, depending on the situation, the circumstances of the case, the defendant will have to create an affirmative defense and he will have to show that his defendant did not do something, right? But that's, that's very rare. In most cases, his job is rather simple. Cast doubt. Cast a reasonable uh, doubt. So let's talk about trial procedures for a moment. So a trial starts with the opening um, argument. Um, so each side 
uh, has an opportunity to set the basic scene for the jurors, introduce them to the court disputes or arguments of the case, and provide them with a general roadmap of how the trial is expected to unfold. Uh, opening statements include phrases such as, Miss Smith will testify on the oath that she, uh, she saw uh, Mr. Johnson do X, and the evidence will show that the defendant did not have Y. Um, although opening statements should be as persuasive as possible, um, they should not include arguments. So the so so opening statements are not are not argumentative, right? It's actually very factual. They will tell you what type of evidence they have, and that's really about it. Um, when it comes to the opening argument uh, or the opening statement, uh, the uh, prosecution goes first, and the defense will go second. After the uh, the uh, opening statements are done, then it is time for the pro it's time for the prosecution to present his case. Uh, and in, in in this part of the process, the prosecution uh, will present you know all the evidence that he has, all the witness testimony that he has, all the documents that he has, um, and when it comes particularly to the to to uh, you know to the prosecution if he has any kind of witnesses or any kind of experts then the prosecutor will engage in direct examination you have to remember that each side the prosecutor will has will have witnesses that will support his case and experts that will support his case the defense attorney is going to have his own set of witnesses that will support his case and experts that will support his case so when the prosecution puts a, a witness there and he wants to ex uh, question that witness his witness then that is called a direct examination he's examining his own witness witness um, however, defense attorneys, once he's done examining a particular witness, his witness, then the first attorney has the ability to cross-examine the witness. That means he's going to question a witness that is not that is not his witness, that is not that does not that does not support his case. And the job of cross-examination is to cast doubt, to question the character, to question the validity, to question the certainty of the evidence. After the prosecution, there we go. So after the after the, after the prosecution is done presenting its case and its witnesses and its evidence, then it is time for the defendant to present his case. So he's going to present his witnesses. He's going to present his evidence. He's going to present uh, his experts. Um, again, uh, what he does really depends on the case and how certain he is of uh, of the prosecution's case. Um, but at the end of the day, the defendant, all, the only thing they have to do is cast doubt on the prosecution's uh, case. That's all they have to do. So it just really depends what they do when they present their case really depends on their circumstances. Most of the time, th they will present witnesses, they will present experts and evidence that will cast doubt on the prosecution's case. If they present any witnesses, if the defense present, presents any of his own witnesses, then the prosecution also has the right to cross-examine uh, that witness. So remember, cross-examining simply means that you are uh, questioning um, somebody else's, the defense attorney's uh, witness or expert, right? When you question your own witness, you are engaged in direct uh, examination. Once the the defense has rested, once the prosecution the the once the prosecution rests its case, once the defense rests its case, then you go on to closing arguments. Uh, closing arguments are not like opening statements. Remember, opening statements are very factual. They're very based on the facts of what happened. Uh, closing arguments are more about persuading the jury to adopt a particular interpretation of the facts. So at this point, uh, parties are free to use sort of hypothetical analogies to make their points, to comment on the credibility of the witness, to discuss how they believe the various species of the puzzle fit in a compelling whole, and to advocate why jurors should decide the case in their favor. So this part of the process is 
more about an argument and they can use analogies hyperbole uh, and and, and and they can make appeal they can make emotional appeals here as well they they're much more than just presenting evidence it's putting everything together uh, when it comes to the closing arguments again the prosecution is going to go first and then the defense goes second but also uh, something really interesting is that the, that the prosecution has the ability to rebut the defense argument so if if the prosecution believes that the defense said something that they need to address the prosecution could again go up and 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 sort of um uh, offer a rebuttal to the arguments put forth by the defense. Once the uh, closing arguments uh, are done, are completed, then um, the the judge will read the instructions to the jury. Now, these instructions were put together way before the, 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 the trial started by both the defense attorney and the prosecution. And the, the purpose of the jury instructions is to um, sort of refocus the attention of the jury. By this point, jury members have heard a lot of evidence. They have heard, you know, they've seen uh, eye count witnesses, expert witnesses, uh, material evidence, physical evidence. Now they need to focus really on the law and what the law says, right? And and the, and, and, and the facts. So the, the purpose of the jury instructions is to have them sort of refocus their attention and focus on the things uh, that actually uh, matter. Now, once they have their instructions, they're going to go to the to the jury room and deliberate. They're going to argue, and they're going to come up with three different al one or three different outcomes. One is a is a guilty verdict in which the, you know uh, they believe that the defendant committed the attack or committed the crime. And in order for you to have a guilty verdict, it the jury must have an anonymous opinion, right? Everybody must agree that yes, based on the evidence, we believe this person committed the crime. Uh, likewise, everybody must also agree to give a not a not guilty verdict. Uh, everybody must believe that the defendant, based on the evidence, that there's reasonable doubt that the defendant uh, did not commit the crimes for which he is accused. If there is disagreements that cannot be sort of um, if there's disagreements that cannot be sorted out then what you have is a hung jury right uh, the jury cannot the, the jury the jury panel cannot agree on a specific uh, outcome and specific decision uh, when you have a hung jury you know what you'll do but you know but most prosecutors well the judge is going to have to cancel the trial and he's going to have to issue a retrial there's going to have to be another trial and so the defense attorney and the prosecution they're going to have to go at it uh, again all over again all the evidence all the witnesses all the experts all the cross-examining everything has to be done again now in the sentencing phase, uh, both sides are going to present evidence. So once you know, the, if once the defendant has been found guilty, now the judge needs to determine what what sentence he's going to get. For the most part, there are sentencing guidelines for the judge to follow, depending on the case, and the, the, there's going to be a recommended range for the judge. But again, m most of the time, depending on the offense, the judge will have um, some type of um, discretion, right? Uh, and, and for that reason, you 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 you're gonna have after the sent after the verdict is given, um, you're gonna have the prosecutor, you're gonna have the defense attorney, not only give a recommendation um, for for what type of sentence the, the the defendant should get, but also they're both gonna talk about. Um, you know, mitigating and extenuating evidence. Sort of, the prosecution will present evidence as to why the defendant should receive the things, the the sentence that he, that they want, that they recommend, and the defense attorney will present evidence uh, about why he or she should not receive a le should receive a lesser sentence. And it might be things completely related to the incident. It could be things like you know, uh, childhood abuse, violence, drug addiction. Uh, evidence that uh, sort of um, 
it makes it seem as this person unfortunately had an unfortunate life and um you know we shouldn't be given that this person that the defendant grew up in this kind of environment you know we should actually feel bad for this defendant and not give him another chance or something to that effect um the defendant can also take the stand and and speak um, and also this is a moment for which the victim can also stand up and speak about you know the the psychological impact the loss or whatever it may be right but victims also have a role in the sentencing phase the judge will take all of it in will take the evidence provided by the you know the prosecution the evidence provided by or the background provided by the defense attorney will take into consideration the um the speech made by the defendant and also the speeches made by the victims and the victims families and will make a determination um based based on all of those now if you guys remember once you're convicted um you may have your case appeal right you may appeal to a higher court to review the actions taken during uh the trial court this is really important because as you guys remember you cannot really appeal based on facts so once you're found guilty of a crime you cannot appeal on the fact that yes i'm, I'm gonna appeal because i'm innocent it doesn't work like that you're guilty uh, and you will forever be found guilty of that crime unless substantial evidence clears you of that um but you can only appeal on uh, uh, based on judicial um uh, error right if you believe that there was an error made by the court and that error impacted uh, your verdict then you may appeal your case and have your case reviewed by, by a higher court if the higher court decides yes there was a judicial error and yes the error led to their conviction then what you're going to get is a is is another trial right you're not going to go scot free you're going to get another trial and hopefully in this new trial that error will not take place um so that is everything for today i think we are about under 40 minutes which is good uh i hope you guys have a wonderful uh thanksgiving break uh, i'm gonna post this lecture in a little bit and also i'm gonna post the slides as well and also i'm gonna post uh journal number journal entry number seven which is due sunday night um, I hope you guys have a wonderful time tomorrow. Stay safe uh, and enjoy that turkey.